Welcome to Wisdom for Life, where we sit through philosophy to find practical advice that you can use in your everyday life. Hi, I'm Dan Hayes, and I'm joined by my co-host, Dr. Greg Sadler, and today we're talking about... Empathy as Human in Philip K. Dick's works, and so this might be a little bit of a departure. This is the first time that we are devoting an entire episode to talking about a work of speculative fiction and a great author in that genre. I mean, we've talked about it before and um, we just never devoted an entire episode to it. So Dan and I were chatting and we were like, yeah, we we were both big fans of Philip K. Dick. And there will be plenty of jokes in this because the fans of Philip K. Dick are known as dickheads. And so, (laughs) you know, we get to make all sorts of dick jokes uh, off of his name. We'll probably try to keep that to some sort of minimum, but we're both huge fans. Some showed like level. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, there, there were some, some things that we wanted to hit on and I kind of thought, well, let's look at probably his most famous work, it, famous in part because of its film adaptation into the the Blade Runner. And there's, there's so much going on in the Android's Dream of Electric Sheep, which is the novel that um, the Blade Runner was uh, drawn from. So we're probably going to be all over the map, I think, in this one. Um, what do there's, you think? It's just such a plethora of different uh, topics and, you know, rabbit trails to go down for us. That's right. So we're going to have to resist going down into rabbit holes and never coming out or going further and further into like a labyrinth of rabbit <laughs> holes. Um, so the, like a maze of death. Oh, there's another <laughs> one of, of Dick's uh, books that I think has not been adapted into no. a film, right? I, uh, as far as I know, no. And I think I've, I've tracked down every single film adaptation, even some of the really, really bad ones, like Screamers. Yeah, I remember seeing that and, and then reading uh, the short story afterwards and being like, ooh, that was not a good one. <laughs> but, but, we're gonna- <laughs> oh, the, the, but the short story is so good. Oh, man, the, that, that, um, the, the twist at the end is... I guess you could kind of see it coming, but it, it's it's a really good twist. He's good at at doing that. This is a little bit off topic, but yeah. Dick <laughs> Dick rivals O. Henry, who was the master of the twist in literature. Um, he probably, in, at least in his short stories, I, I don't know if we can say that about his novels so much. They don't usually end with like a a little zinger or something. Yeah, but like a lot of the short stories, yes, definitely, like. It's it's hard. Like I love his novels, but there's something that's about like maybe it's just the editing process and yeah. the short stories that really keep the the idea in a, a really short. It's like okay, you know, it's like making a, a TV show um, that's you know has to be 22 minutes. Okay, you know, you're cutting all the cruff. Right, right, yeah. One of the one of my favorite short stories, is, and I forget the name of it. There's a guy who's kind of a jerk to his wife, and he goes off on some mission to another planet in another star system, and he comes back, and she notices. Uh, we'll remember it for you wholesale. I don't think it's that one. Um, no, he comes back, and he is different. He's attentive, he's loving, he looks at their kid as if he's like a real father. And her. now that I remember, her brother is like one of these guys who's in charge of like making sure aliens are not infiltrating our society. And she realizes that he's been replaced by an alien, uh. but she covers it up. Because she likes this guy better. <laughs> so the lesson out there for, for you, you know, uh, hearing this is you better be on your guard to be a decent person because otherwise you might be replaced by somebody who, and well, this is a good segue, somebody who has more empathy, right? Right. Um, so uh, we're 
if we want, we can go uh, a little bit into kind of the overarching themes that we're going to be talking about here. With yeah, uh, let's do that. So um, we're talking mostly here about do androids dream of electric sheep, which is the uh, uh, what became known as Blade Runner when uh, Ridley Scott made it into a film starring Harrison Ford in the 1980s. Yeah, um, 82, I think. Right? 82. Yeah. And um, so we, we've got a number of different things here, specifically um, uh, ideas in em- empathy, what like makes a human a human, um, and also a lot about um, memory and how um, uh, these things affect both our our humanity or just even like um, what makes someone to have a value in there. Um, and then, yeah, well, um, what makes a person a person, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. How do you make that distinction, especially if we're talking about which one of the major uh, ideas discussed here is, you know, um, these uh, artificial humans, the, the Nexus models, uh, the Nexus Six models specifically. Um, here of these from the, I guess, in the movie it's the Tyrell Corporation, and I forget what the the, the version Rosen the Corporation, Rosen, right? Yeah, I'd forgotten you. that it was a different corporation. There's so many. Uh, we're going to get to this in a bit, but there's so many divergences between the movie and the book, a lot of which seem to be kind of unnecessary. So Mm -hmm. instead of it being androids, it's replicants. Instead of it being um, bounty hunters, it's blade runners, you know? Mm -hmm. So Um, as as well as like, you know, whole big areas like (laughs) Mercerism that is absolutely cut out, uh, uh, you know, Rick Deckard actually has a wife in the, the book where he's not, but like, let, let's get to the themes first. And we well, can before dig that, into though, that. Let's, let's talk about Dick. Um, cause, okay. cause you can, yeah, yeah. you can never get enough talking about Dick, right? Oh yeah. I love Dick. <laughs> so <laughs> who, who was this guy for, for, I think a lot of people know him by reputation, but maybe they don't know that much about him. We're not going to like do a whole biography here. We just want some context for people who might not be as familiar with his, his work and his thought and his life and his influence. So the first thing you can say about the guy is he's a science fiction writer and he was in the solidly in the the 20th century. He dies in 1982 shortly before Blade Runner comes out. Um, But he he was very prolific. He wrote, you know, dozens of novels, short stories, lived most of his life in California. Um, That's where a lot of the stories are actually set. And um, I will point out that he wrote what are called realistic novels as well. But the poor guy got pigeonholed as a sci-fi writer. So these realistic novels like um, Milton Lumpke territory, they, they, nobody would publish them. And they've been subsequently published. And as, as a matter of fact, he had kind of a hard life, uh, Philip K. Dick. Um, very colorful, um, kind of tragic, married five times. A lot of strained relationships, uh, did a lot of drugs over the course of his life, which doesn't really help things out. As a matter of fact, he uh, he had a connection with Ursula K. Le Guin. They actually went to high school together but didn't know each other at the time. And they did, like, get connected later. And she was like, I don't want you visiting my house because I, I don't want my kids seeing all this drug use and you're kind of erratic. So... So there's that side. Um, I did I'll just oh, go ahead. to interject. Um, yeah, one of the things that really the brought it home is that the the epilogue or like the the, the afterward for um, mm. scanner uh, darkly. The scanner darkly. Yeah, yeah. Talks about one his experience and how it has made his life worse, as well as it runs through a. Uh, a list of the people that he's been close to who have either died or have been severely crippled due to their drug use. And so it's really sobering, um, especially because the the major themes of that book are all about drug use to the point of um, becoming unmoored from reality. Yeah. You know, another theme that fits in there that connects up with, uh, the Android's Dream of Electric Sheep. He talks about the drug user um, for this this drug, and I forget the name of it, um, becoming almost like an insect, a mere stimulus response machine, which is what we're seeing the um, androids being reduced to as well. The question is, are they? Yeah. 
Yeah. So, you know, he, there's, there's a huge book that, um, I actually have a, a copy of. It's so, it's so big. It's probably about like four pounds, the exegesis of Philip K. Dick. And, you know, you can read your way through it and find out what was going on in his head. I don't, I don't find it particularly helpful for the Android's dream of electric sheep necessarily, but, um, it's, it's interesting that he spent so much time on that project trying to make sense out of this spiritual experience that he had. And clearly the things that he was writing were not just to make money, which he didn't do an awful lot of, <laughs> and, or to get fame, which again, didn't get a lot of in his lifetime, unfortunately. Um, he was, he was like kind of doing philosophical work through his literature. Absolutely. I mean, I think that's like the reason why both of us are kind of enthralled by his mm. writings and the reason that we are even bringing this up here. And so like, there's lots of sci-fi writers that, out there that I think we both enjoy, but it's not something that like, oh yeah, I definitely have to you know dig into the philosophical ideas that are in a lot of these books because they're usually pretty, you know, bereft of, of something significantly diff- uh, deep yeah, as well as yeah. something that is um, novel. And it feels like Dick really, you know, explored areas that were um, novel to the world experience, at least written. Yeah, or if he wasn't the person who came up with it, he found a new take, a new spin to put on it. Um, is this is kind of a good, way, good time to jump into, like, what it is that we particularly like about Dick. Um, and we can talk, you know, if we have time later about the different film adaptations. We'll just point out that Unfortunately, Dick did not live <clears throat> to see um, the first film adaptation, Blade Runner, in the theaters. He got to see a director's cut before he died of complications of a stroke in uh, 1982. So you mentioned one thing that you particularly like about uh, Dick's works. What, what else is it that you like about him? Um, like the There's a recurring uh, theme of dealing with reality and how we interact with it. Um, and either, you know, we're talking about like through spiritual means, through, through drug means, through, you know, potentially being dead in another universe or on, you know, what it is to be, you know, uh, a android and that, um, reality and that being in the universe and how we interact as those characters or not. Um, He's, he's constantly um, trying to investigate the different ways in which our uh, either our perceptions or the actual ontology of the world that we're living in is changing. A lot of times this is in commune with others. And yeah. It's something that will um, show up here in Do Android Dream of Electric Sheep, um, but also in commune with like some other... Um, large creature that you become like immersed in in a like a communal consciousness um and that is uh something definitely that uh people have says borne out from partly his his drug use and then having a different um change in perception from that and uh and leading him to a point where um he might not know exactly where his own reality ends and a, a false reality ends and he's trying to uh investigate that through his uh, novels and works yeah i i really like how the characters are in effect, doing philosophy and playing around with ideas from philosophy or psychology or in some cases theology, they, they get woven into, um, their thoughts, their interactions, the, as we nowadays call them, info dumps where a character is explaining something to another character. And every time that Dick does it, you, you, you know, first of all, he actually has read the stuff. He's done the work. Mm-hmm. But he's not going to present it like an academic does. He's going to like put it into a framework that we can relate to. And we're like, oh, yeah, that idea actually has some practical effects, at least in this imaginary universe. And I, I love that about his his works. Yeah. Um, and we'll get to it later. But like one of the, the people that uh, I guess kind of a similar idea is he's um, – the the mood organ, which is a oh, right. tool in yeah, which yeah. <laughs> um, the um, 
you, you the can, characters are using in order to like experience things, kind of um, to to make uh, feelings of either depression or, or ma- mania or anything in between there. Um, but it's um, a Penfield is a Penfield yeah, uh, mood, mood organ, organ. Yeah. and Penfield is actually a real person. He is a um, was a surgeon who was one of the first people to, he's a brain surgeon specifically, pers- uh, came out and while he was doing brain surgery, he was started on the first person to uh, electrically stimulate portions of the brain and ask them while they're still conscious, what are they thinking? Yeah. And so not only are they uh, having those memories come to mind, but uh, if you hit the right places, people would actually experience their memories as if they were physically embodied in them. And so this is an, an interesting idea from actual science that he has now uh, brought in as a, an object in which the characters are using on a day-to-day basis. I think the mood organ, and this is something that is left out of the Blade Runner, is a mm-hmm. really interesting idea just by itself. The notion that we can tinker around <clears throat> with how we're feeling or even what we desire because there's a there's a mood organ setting uh, the that creates the desire to dial another mood. Right? So, so it's kind of self-referential. So if you, it, it's sort of like people who can't decide what they should eat for dinner, right? And you're at a certain point, you're like, just just pick something. So there's there's a button for that. This notion that we're not we're not totally um, passive. We have an agency in it, and yet we get to like literally push our own buttons. It's really an interesting uh, conjecture, isn't it? I mean, we kind of do yeah. stuff like this with what, like Foucault calls technologies of the self, or um, Pierre Ado calls uh, spiritual exercises, where we're taking things from maybe ancient philosophy like Stoicism or Epicureanism, and we're you know like doing negative visualization. That's a way of pushing our own buttons, right? Um, but this is a mechanical means for it. And there's like a catalog in the book that um, Erin, uh, uh, Rick Deckard's wife, is paging through to figure out what she wants to dial up next. <laughs> um, as, as well as, I, I believe, like, this is the very first, one of the very first scenes in the book, if not the very first yeah, scene in the book, yeah. is, is they're, they're talking about this. And it ends kind of on this cheeky moment in which he's like, oh, you know, dial up the, um, my husband always knows what's right. <laughs> Thing. But later, like, on, later on in the book, she's depressed again when he calls and he's like, what happened to mood? And I forget, it's like 613. She's like, oh, yeah. yeah. As soon as you left, I dialed a different mood. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and, and as you were talking about, like, um, there's uh, she in the dialed it to be depressive twice a month, I think. Um, and, yeah. and then, but has uh, three hours for her to be in this depressive mood in which then it will automatically switch to another thing in the future to make sure that because of your it, constantly in this depressed mood then you'll maybe not ever, ever have the desire to in die order to actually it, yeah exactly yeah and we should and we should talk about that a little bit <clears throat> you know one of the the reasons why in the the book she says that she should do that like almost like purging herself um every so often is because they're living in an environment in which um human beings have become much more scarce. And so there's all these empty apartments and she she is not being bothered by it. Yeah, yeah. Well that's right. Everybody's emigrating to the the colonies or to Mars. And that's that's there in the the movie, but it's never really explained what the effect of that is. Isidore lives in a place all by himself and there's just, you know, uh, every other apartment is filled with garbage basically that they call kipple, you know, the breakdown of of things. And it's very you get the sense that there's like a a deep loneliness that Erin thinks we should um, feel bad about and experience every once in a while. We shouldn't. This goes to the reality thing, right? Do we live in a reality that we manufacture for ourselves where we feel okay and happy, or do we allow ourselves to feel the negative moods that are reflecting the reality that we're in? You know, so uh, a little background. You just grabbed, talked about Isidore. So this is J.R. Isidore is another character that doesn't actually appear in the movie. No, uh, no, he does, but he's changed. But they, they've they've changed him so much. I don't consider okay. him the same character. Well, that's like, interesting. 
Um, because he's, at least within the book, he is um, what they call a chicken head. He's been um, hit by the radiation. So, you know, another step back here. Yeah. Um, they're living, the reason why everyone's immigrating on Earth is that there was a, a World War terminus in which it was a nuclear war. And so we've ruined um, the environment to the point where large portions of the Earth are uh, uninhabitable and have lots of radiation yeah, and yeah. this has caused mutations or de- degradations in the populace and if you um, the degradation happens in your brain then you become what they refer to as a chicken head or and, special, and this is yeah, what yeah. yeah special um and and if you're special you can't re- uh, immigrate off the planet anymore and so jr isidore at least in the book is a special mentally um and um, in that he's been uh, he, he removes himself from society in part because of how society has been treating him as this special. Yeah, and he um, he has to have a pretty menial job as well. Uh, you know what we should do is we should jump ahead. We'll come back to like some of the passages that we've got selected from this great speech that Dick gave the android and the human. But let's let's actually like overview the the book and the movie a bit. So anybody who doesn't already have these you know ready to mind knows precisely what we're talking about. So as Dan said, there's there's a world war, and that happens a long time ago. It creates this radioactive dust, um, which is a big problem. Men have to go around in lead cod pieces to you know protect their their precious junk, and um, there's there's a lot of things going wrong with this this world. Yeah, they protect their Philip K. Dicks. <laughs> yeah, well. <laughs> and they're they're accompanying. Uh, I mean, the real payoff yes. is is protecting the 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 nuts, right? And yes. uh, speaking of nuts, there are very few squirrels left in this world, just as there's very few animals. Um, and so animals have become rare, and human beings have. Um, you know, if we think about empathy today, right, there's lots of people who are abusive to animals. We can say, well, that's not a distinctively human trait in our present. But in, in this future, human beings feel empathy towards animals. They want to protect them. They want to, you know, comfort them. They want to take care of them. And that's that's a sign of uh, humanity. And well, go ahead. This is specifically spurred on by this religious movement that right. is called Mercerism. Yeah. And so in the advent of a, a global nuclear war, um, a, a religious individual named Mercer um, has risen up and um, in the you know, the wake of you know, this massive uh, devastation, um, preaches this thing of uh, empathy as, as the, the core theme. And so you show your empathy not only for like others, humans, but specifically in taking care. And so one of the main tenets of the religion is to take care of some other living creature, some yeah. animal. Um, and if you, and because they are so uh, uncommon because of, you know, nuclear war, people will buy electric versions of these animals. Thus, the name of the book, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? Yeah. People have electric sheep. Rick Deckard has an electric sheep in which he takes care of. And so not only is... Um, and then the other major tenant of this uh, religion is also to use this mood organ that we were talking about earlier in order to share these empathetic feelings well, there's, with everyone else. There it's the empathy box, though. So you you, oh, yeah, you like grab both close, handles yeah. and and uh, and yeah you, sh- you you share fusion is what they call it mm-hmm. um, and it's not just mood you like I mean what is this is this a hallucination is this participating in Mercer's memories I mean it, it, get- it, it, it I think it's it's, it's both both because uh, like another tenet of the religion is put forward is to um, physically feel uh, so. Uh, Mercer has this either like Sisyphusian and or kind of Christ-like thing where he walks up this hill and he's pelted by stones and at the, at the top of the hill he dies. Yeah. So there's this idea is to like, uh, with this empathy box, you grab both things and you are physically feeling um, not only just like the, the straight like visual and perceptual feelings, but you're feeling being pelted with stones and that's to, to uh, create a, a greater um, 
empathetic connection with uh, this this uh, individual as well as everyone else around you. And it seems to work, you know, quite well. Um, so unfortunately, it's oh, go ahead. fraud. Well, yes and no. I mean, uh, it's interesting in the book. So there, there is this big revelation that um, happens uh, short, maybe like three quarters of the way through the book, yeah. where that Dan's referring to, where Mercer was actually an actor and it was filmed, and you can see the set things behind him, and this Buster Friendly reveals it on the air. Um, Buster Friendly's been around for decades. He's a like a, he's a, he's a TV host. Yeah. And, and he might be an android himself, for all we know. Um, but the, the main, going back to kind of like an overview of the story, the main conflict in here right. is that Rick Deckard is a bounty hunter in the book, otherwise known as a Blade Runner in the movie, in which his job is to um, hunt down and find these replicants who have returned to Earth after being, um, you know, slave labor, basically, and, and uh, throwing the colonies, over their yeah. masters out in the colonies to come uh, and hide out on Earth. Yeah, and so it's illegal for them <clears throat> to be present on Earth, and they're all like the top of the line. They're Nexus Sixes, who have the best brains and, and, and you know, the best Lots reflexes. Of, yeah. And so um, going back to the Mercerism thing, Mercerism says it's okay to kill the killers. And the, right. and the androids are the killers in part because they um, they do kill human beings, but they also lack empathy for animals and for each other. They don't. Mm-hmm. They don't. Uh, they don't have that response that human beings do, or at least they are purported to. Yeah, have lack of empathy. Well, in the book, it's it's hard to argue that any of them do, in fact, possess empathy. For... I was thinking besides um, Rachel, but yes, uh, at least in the book, they're they're all very. You know, uh, what is it? Um, schizoid is how they're described. Yeah, a, a psychiatric category that we don't really use that much today, but what was very common when Dick was writing this in, in the 70s and the 80s to talk about people being schizoid, meaning that they had a, a flattened affect. They didn't, um, how would you say, value things the way that mm. the rest of us do, you know? L- looked at things kind of very cold and, and, right, and logical right. without you know, a strong empathetic response in any way. Yeah. So um, one of the things to keep going on with, with this that, that comes up that will lead us into um, talking about uh, the empathy thing itself is there's a test that has been developed to ferret out who's an android and who's a human being. And it's called the, the Voight Camp test. And if you've ever seen the movie, there's oh. like, you know, that there's that bladder thing kind of sucking and you're focusing on the person's eye it's it's not quite so creepy in the book <laughs> and and the, the one of the issues with the movie is that it doesn't really explicitly say what is going on it's kind of right like, it would help if you read the book to know what the heck is going on here with the void contest and uh but yeah, it's the main thing here is uh, it's administered and it's asking a number of questions or trying to um, elicit a uh, empathetic emotional response, um, and it's looking for specifically um, autonomic responses. So that's yeah. why one of the reasons that they're looking like really closely at the eye to see like you know your um, the automatic. Uh, how much your pupil dilates. Or That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And then there was one other thing as well. Uh, was it skin stuff or I, I don't yeah. remember exactly how it works, but there's two inputs and androids fail when being asked these questions. Although the, the, the book begins with, and again, the movie doesn't convey this that well. Um, the book begins with worries about whether the test is accurate or not. So Deckard, uh, is going over to the Rosen Corporation where he meets Rachel Rosen, who's, you know, played by Sean Young in the movie. And he's, he's supposed to like check out some of these new androids with the test. And the guy in charge says, Hey, uh, do it on her. She's a human being. I want to make sure that we don't get a, uh, false positive. And mm-hmm. then, um, 
while she does test positive for being an android. And then um, Elgin, I think his name is, says, oh, well, see, your test doesn't work because she's a human being. She was just raised out there in outer space. And that's why, you know, she doesn't have the normal emotional reaction. So you're going to, you know, you're likely to be killing some some human beings who don't have the right reactions. And this is a real worry, right? You know, mm-hmm. who, who counts, who doesn't. And then he, um, Deckard gives her one more question and it's clear that that she really is an android and then you know um she plays an important role in in the thing and he he gives a couple more void camp tests to other people including the the opera singer uh Luba luft um he also gives it to himself and yeah. in well, the, he uh, go ahead. He, he gives it um uh, in conjunction with another um uh, Bounty hunter, right? So they're, Phil they're, Resch. They're, yeah, right. And so they're they're both looking at okay, um, because at, at one point in time it is found out that uh, Rick Deckard's superior is actually an android, as well as his entire like uh, police district. As no, also- Phil Phil Resch, uh, Rick Deckard um, is being tricked. R- remember, uh, Phil Resch is the one who's at the fake police station. Oh, I've I've messed that it's up. It's easy. But, it's easy or, to conflate them. I think. Yeah. Yeah. So, but the main issue is there. It's been found out that there is a whole police station that was totally um, <laughs> android all, infested. All, as exactly. Yeah. Um, and so they're like, "Well, how do we know that we're not ones?" Like, especially after we've already talked about uh, Rachel Rosen, who um, believes that she is a human, even though that she is not. Although later we find out she doesn't, right? Um, that she's like, I mean, it, it's unclear. Yeah. Maybe she's being given like new resets and new memories each time. But she sleeps with the bounty hunters, gets them to feel empathy towards her, and then they can't do their jobs anymore. Except for Phil Resch, who she said yeah, was, uh, was, a, was a kooky guy, you know? Although it's very interesting if you're looking at Phil Resch because um, like Rick Deckard um, feels uh, like – his connection to his electric sheep is a rather muted. Like yeah, he, he's yeah. he's not so like into it. Like he does it because it is expected um, for someone to have an animal and do it. Whereas Phil Resch, he has a squirrel and he adores his squirrel. He gushes about his squirrel. He like <laughs> the the empathy yeah, yeah. comes easy for him for this squirrel, but on. Uh, in response to uh, the androids, uh, he has zero qualms about killing them. Whereas Rick Deckard has, he begins well, like, to have qualms. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. And and and, 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 and so Rush he, likes killing him. That's right. part of what's different. Yeah. So it's almost right. the opposite of empathy, right? Right. And and so um, it's been talked about like how Mercer's them, especially when they're talking about to kill the killers. Yeah. Um, is a kind of a perversion of empathy in this i'm um, saying okay i'm going to weaponize empathy and use it as something to create an in-group and an out-group and i'm going to say oh we can empathize with the humans but we can't empathize with the the, the androids. androids they're yeah. the QLers. but also um, it refers to early on anyone can be determined to killers, not just the androids. Right. And it is up to those followers of Mercer to basically accuse and then dispatch the killers. Yeah. It's interesting, too, because Mercer, again, not in the movie at all, but Mercer is going to show up in the book and talk to uh, Deckard. Uh, and Deckard is really, you know, he's, he's very upset. And he's like, um, do I have to kill these androids? It's, you know, I'm, ha- I'm having to go against my own feelings and identity. And Mercer is like, it, it almost sounds like something coming from the Bhavagad Gita, right? Where, um, if you're a warrior, well, you got to do a warrior's job. Don't, don't worry about it. Just do the job. And Mercer <laughs> himself is, is saying this to Deckard. Um, so we, we've talked, we've hinted a, a lot about, um, empathy. We've talked a lot about androids. Um, Dick actually has this great talk called the android and the human that we wanted to hit on. Well, what distinguishes androids and humans? So he tells us that, um, 
our world, and I think, I mean, it, this is even more the case now, um, our man-made world of machines, artificial constructs, computers, electronic systems, interlinking homeostatic components, this is becoming more and more to possess what psychologists fear the primitive sees in his environment, animation. In a very real sense, he says, our environment is becoming alive, or at least quasi-alive, and in ways specifically, fundamentally, here's the key word, analogous to ourselves machines are becoming more human so to speak so how do we how do we know what's actually human and then he says i have in some of my stories and novels written about androids or robots or simulacra the name doesn't matter what what is meant is artificial constructs masquerading as humans and then this is very interesting he says to me that that theme seems obsolete the constructs don't mimic humans. They are, in many deep ways, already human, actually human already. They're not trying to fool us. They merely follow lines we follow in order that they too may overcome such common problems as the breakdown of vital parts, loss of power source, attack by foes such as storms, short circuits. And I'm sure any one of us here can testify a short circuit, especially in our power supply, can ruin our entire day and make us utterly unable to get to our daily job or once at the office, useless as far as doing the work set on our desk. So he's saying that we're, at least at that, that time that he's writing um, and talking, we're reaching the point where it's not about just imitation. They're becoming like us. They're not just pretending to be us. There's, there's lines that are being crossed in a way, right? Right. And so this goes back to um, when uh, Deckard and uh, remind me of the other uh, bounty hunter. Oh, Phil Resch, yeah. yeah. Phil Resch are are talking and they're giving each other the like contest to make sure that they're not yeah. androids are themselves. Is that you know at this point in time, um, that they, they have this discussion about, um, is it okay to extend empathy to the androids? And they say like, no, 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 we have to have this distinction. There has to be this line. We are the thing that holds that line between us. Yeah. Um, that is their job, and um, the question is, why? Why do they have to be this line? Why does there have to, as as these things progress closer and closer to us? Yeah. Why can't we extend that empathy to these new things? You know, and there's a couple points in the book where the androids actually they they talk kind of bitterly about like you humans, you view us as like not even worth what a cockroach is. I mean, they don't use exactly that word. I, I forget exactly what they say, but. Um, there's this sense that maybe this conflict doesn't have to to be there, you know? Right. Now, he, he goes on in the, the thing, and he says, in the field of abnormal psychology, the schizoid personality structure is well-defined. There's a con continual paucity or lack of feeling. The person thinks rather than feels his way through life. And then he says, there's a certain parallel between what I call the android personality and the schizoid. Both have a mechanical reflex quality. And then he says, another quality of the android mind is the inability to make exceptions. Perhaps this is the essence of it, the failure to drop a response when it fails to accomplish results, but rather to repeat it over and over again. Lower life forms are skillful in offering the same response continually as our flashlights. And then he says, let me now express another element that strikes me as an essential key, revealing the authentically human. It's not only an intrinsic property of the organism, but the situation in which it finds itself. That which happens to it, that which it is confronted by, pierced by, and must deal with, certain agonizing situations create on the spot a human where a moment before there was only, as the Bible says, clay. Possibly the difference between what I call the android mentality and the human is that the latter passed through something the former did not, or at least it passed through it and responded differently, changed, altered what it did, and hence what it was it became. Now, so this raises a lot of really interesting questions, I, I think, about this book and what happens in it. Because So if we've got these three ways of identifying 
um, the Android. It's got a mechanical reflex quality. It, it has an inability to make exceptions, and it, it kind of just sticks to its programming rather than becoming something new, something something bigger. Well, that seems to apply to a hell of a lot of humans, doesn't it? So that's that's kind of scary to think about. <laughs> On the other hand, are there any Android characters who escape their programming? You know, are we talking in this book or in, in other? So in this media? book, the I think the answer is no. But I right. think in other Dick stories, the answer is yes. Or even the um, if we go to the the film adaptations, you know, especially yeah. like um. Within Blade Runner, I uh, definitely right. see that a bit with um, the Rachel character. Yeah, yeah. Um, and and also the question of is um, Deckard actually a, a replicant himself? That becomes much less known. It's yeah. more mired in like is he or not? Um, and then even um, in, in the continuing- movie, though, what about Roy Beatty at the end? Oh yes, he, he, he saves Deckard's life. Mm-hmm. Giving him his life back gives that wonderful speech that apparently Rutger Hauer made up. Well, I think the, the the main thing that he made up was just that final line: "The um all lost like tears in the rain." I believe okay. the, the rest of that was was you know, was like, part was part of the script. Yeah, was okay. it like a battleships on the, the um uh, belt thought, of Orion yeah, or exactly, something? Like yeah, that. <laughs> um, and it's it's a beautiful little thing and a very. Um, apropos, uh, it's it's very much like showing this this growth of these characters and like you know they're they're trying to okay. live their lives and they're at, and at the at least at the very end here yeah uh, yeah he he says like I, I, he's basically having empathy and saying like I'm gonna let you live in this regard and it results in his own death yeah and that is empathy in the way that Dick means it so we should jump into talking about empathy we've, we've used Absolutely. this word a lot yeah <laughs> it, the first thing we got to say is there is no one single take on what empathy is there is no consensus whether in the present or historically so it's kind of a slippery word you know it means a lot of different things um sometimes people will confuse it with or distinguish it against um, a whole bunch of other moral vocabulary words like mercy or pity or compassion, sympathy, emotional contagion, emotional intelligence. And so there's there's no one single way of parsing all of these together. And if you ask different people like, well, how many different kinds of empathy are, are there? You're going to get different answers. Some people say there's two. Some people will say there's four. Some people will, will distinguish even even more. Um, psychology today has this nice little thing. Empathy is the ability to recognize, understand, and share the thoughts and feelings of another person, animal, or fictional character. We can empathize with Rick Deckard or with Rachel Rosen. Um, and I think that's kind of right, but I don't know that that's exactly what Dick thinks. I mean, sharing the thoughts, it's more about like being able to respond to the feelings, you know? Yeah, I, of, I, of others. I like the idea of um, appropriation, appropriation of, of one's uh, uh, of another's desires as mm. well as, and so like bringing these things into yourself. Yeah, uh, yeah. And um, knowing, like, okay, they're probably not going to like if one does this to them. If they're in that situation, yeah, they're going to kind of feel poorly, and they'd rather not do that. So maybe I want to, you know. Uh, one, you know, have that same feeling or to try to alleviate whatever is happening therein. I think appropriation is a great term. And this is like way, this is a big rabbit hole that we're not going to go too far <laughs> down in. But we, we've talked about it before. Well, this is a way that we translate the uh, Greek term oikiosis that plays a really important role in Stoicism, in Stoic philosophy. And it, it involves like a affection for yourself and, and grasp uh, perceptually of, of yourself, which then you extend to others. Um, sort of like you would to family members that you you care about. But I also think appreciation is another term here. Like if I have empathy towards you, I appreciate what it is that you think, feel, how you view a situation 
So, you know, Decker talks about like predator and prey and says, well, a predator can't really have too much empathy because then it would realize its prey wants to stay alive. <laughs> you know? um, but he has, I mean, he, he, he's got something like that developing for these androids. Yeah. And that, that's uh, continue on with the spider analogy. He, he, they're oh. making this things about like um, mm. predators as these uh, solo um, individuals that go around, and so they're they're not social creatures, yeah. and thus that's the reason why they they get to this this like lack of empathy thing. But any creature in which lives in social groups has to develop empathy, and so this yeah, is, you know, so, uh, one of our our fi- favorite topics that we think about is as us humans, we are social primates. That is one of the main ways that we interact with the world and how we developed as a species, and yeah. that is has a very strong impact on how we see the world. Now, spiders are an interesting topic for for three reasons. One is there are spiders who are not only, you could say, non-empathetic towards their normal prey. There are spiders who prey on other spiders who actually go over to their webs and like pull on the web to simulate another kind of insect. And when that spider comes down, then the the hunting spider jumps on it and, and, and eats it. Right? So that's that's one extreme. But we also do seem to have social spiders, right? We have those spiders that make those vast webs together. Um, and so I don't know. I, I'm kind of conflicted about this spider example. And then we have a spider, of course, in the story who is the subject of the androids um, torturing it effectively, Alice. right? Yeah, yeah. And, and it, it, it's one of the reasons why J.R. Isidore, uh, I would say, uh, betrays them. Because he was kind of working with them to a certain extent, but he, he watches as Pris on um, one of the androids right. uh, slowly pulls off its legs and says, "Like, can it walk with only four? And he is absolutely beside himself in watching her commit this act of cruelty to so such a small creature. Yeah, and then Roy actually he's like, "It's not moving, so we'll light a, a match and you know put it by the spider, and then the spider takes off." <clears throat> so there's additional cruelty on top of that. Yeah, this is definitely well, the, one of the big differences between the book and the movie is that the in the uh, the book uh, over and over and over again the the androids are really shown to uh, like strongly lack this empathy. And they lack empathy towards each other, too. I mean, that's that's something that comes up is an android will sell out another android. And, and they say that, the characters themselves, like Roy Beatty, um, when Isidore is choosing to protect them, um, the three androids that are staying with him are like, wow, you know, we wouldn't do this for each other. <laughs> this guy, look at this guy, you know. And, uh, of course, then they, they – as. Dan just said they ruin it by um, torturing the poor little spider. Um, right. So uh, coming back to empathy, you know, before we get into, you know, looking at how it figured into the book itself, um, some people want to make a distinction between, you know, cognitive and emotional empathy, where it's like cognitive, you, you can like place yourself in the other person's position you can like think about what life would be like for them and then you can respond i guess you can reason it through properly and then emotional empathy is where you actually feel caring or um where you i mean the book has a really great thing um you you um feel joy at others joy you feel suffering at others suffering and, um, I mean, this is like Aristotle talking about friendship where he, ma- he actually makes that in his Nicomachean ethics, one of the hallmarks of friendship that if you're friends with somebody, really friends with them, you feel good about them feeling good. You feel bad about them feeling bad, you know? Um, and then it's interesting because, uh, in addition to these cognitive and emotional, there's there's other theorists like Daniel Goleman, the emotional intelligence guy, who wants to add uh, a third dimension being compassionate. And again, we see this blurring between compassion and empathy, right? Are they different or is it the same? And so being compassionate would be like when you have both cognitive and emotional empathy, and then you do stuff. You actually, so it might, we might, instead of calling it compassionate, we might call it like action oriented. You do things that are, empathetic or you're you do empathy towards the other person you know 
like you see somebody crying at their desk in the workplace, right? And you go over and um, you say, oh, hey, what's what's going on? You know, and then they start telling you about something. Um, now, of course, this could get you in trouble in some workplaces, but you put your hand on their shoulder. You know, you say, hey, it's going to be okay. That might be what compassionate empathy looks like. Although, interestingly, and one of the themes that is explored here in the book is the difference between performative empathy and actual like actually feeling that and so we see this with decker yeah. where he's kind of more performative with his uh care of the sheep um versus others like um with the, the squirrel and yeah how, yeah uh as we talked about earlier I won't do you do think again. do you think uh, i mean uh, it just occurred to me so Deckard has a, a wife in the book that he doesn't have in, in the blade runner mm-hmm. um he feels some empathy or he exhibits some empathy towards her. But do you think that in the very beginning, it's more performative than, than actual. And she shows empathy towards him towards the end of the book. But yeah, I mean, early on, he's like, ah, I should have divorced her when I had the chance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Deckard's a, a little bit of a, a sad individual overall. Um, I, yeah. I don't know. I, maybe he had empathy at one point in time for her. Oh, but maybe he, I don't know. I'm I'm uncertain. Yeah, I mean, but that's another thing. It, it, it's not as if we have like unlimited capacities for empathizing, right? That is we, a whole extra discussion. I think. Yeah, um, but I, I do want to catch uh, another topic quickly if yeah. you don't mind on uh, about uh, memory and and how um, one of the big things that they talk about of like what makes person not only is it this um, this uh, empathy response but also the memories that they possess um, and this is explored um, even more in like Blade Runner 2049 right um, right and yeah. um, one of the big things that we see is their um, you know effective response um to to things and so they have like this really poor at least in in the original book as well as in Blade Runner they have this really poor effective response to things that should be um uh, empathetically stunning whereas um, yeah as you continue on especially if you even if you see with um uh Rachel um she has a full set of memories all going all the way back to childhood but they are fake memories and yeah. so they are implanted memories and as well as in Blade Runner 2049 um the the newer models of these uh Nexus robots um from the Tyrell Corporation are actually having these and the, what it seems to be is that it allows the um androids to uh have a a, a more able to um control their uh emotional responses because they have this like grounding in memory yeah. given to them but this also really strongly reminds me of um be a skinner and the idea of the skinner box interesting uh, so you got to explain that a bit for our audience I yeah think. um and so <sighs> well he was oh, a behaviorist maybe, maybe, psychologist yeah and so I, I, I um, I think I've actually just uh, conflated two things. What is the box in which you um, have you can go into it and you can experience everything? Oh, um, that's the experience machine, ex- ex- uh, Robert. Exactly. Nozick, I'm sorry. Yeah. No, well, ex- uh, yeah. I mean, I can see connections to both, though. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, Skinner's basic idea was operant conditioning that you would um i mean he kind of thought like people are basically meat robots you know Mm -hmm. um so you got that on the one side and then the experience machine which we talked about in in previous episodes we were talking about thought experiments yes it's a machine you go inside and you pre-program it and it gives you like super lifelike experiences to the point where you don't know that you're not really experiencing it and you can set it for like you know two years and then it, it uh something dings and you leave it or <laughs> whatever right or whatever thing Wait. you want so the androids are basically it's as if they've been brought up in an experience machine right which is exactly so like a stimulus response thing because it's supposed to produce certain emotional effects 
Right, because you're, you're basically, by creating this whole series of memories, you are creating a expected output from inputs, which is definitely the right. Skinner box. Yeah, yeah. But um, Nozick uh, and the Experience Machine um, also very much explore in other books, especially We Can Remember It For You Wholesale, which turns into um, Total Recall. Right, right. Um, yeah. Um, is uh, this... Exactly. The, the whole idea that we, we've now made these new androids that actually have these full memories, is that what makes someone human? Um, and that because, at least within Blade Runner 2049, these uh, new androids are much closer to humans than right. at least in the original one. And, and they're closer to how they're portrayed as Rachel in Blade Runner. I mean, if we have to depend on memories being really, really true in order for us to be human, we're all screwed because our memories of things are very much like, you know, we call them confabulations, right? Uh, in a lot of cases. Um, even when people have traumatic memories, which is preserving something that, you know, they might choose to forget otherwise, there's still some distortion going on. Um, it's interesting, too, that in the book, human beings are said you can't really implant fake memories in them like you can in an android because it it um, screws them up mm. um, whereas it it works out well for for androids yeah um any last thoughts before we go through our you know uh, in the movie I, I kind of like that thing that you pointed out that Rachel, She's not Rachel Rosen. She'd be Rachel Tyrell then, right? Mm -hmm. um, she does seem to develop, um, which shouldn't be happening. Possible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So in a way, the the movie is a little bit more optimistic about um, Android's capacity to develop. I mean, she, she clearly has empathy for Deckard in the movie, um, although she doesn't in the book, she, she reveals that, I mean, she sleeps with him. Yeah. Um, but it's a ruse. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, there's a, um, we only talked on, on the Kipple a little bit, but there's definitely this connection between both the, um, empathy and as a building up versus yeah, um, and the, the killers, which are entropy, which yeah. are breaking down things. Um, and that's a, another nice um, juxtaposition that I think uh, I would love to talk about at another time. Yeah. And Mercer is right at the heart of it, because in the discussion of Kipple and the tomb world and breakdown and all that, um, Mercer is is viewed as the exception to this world that's just in in collapse. So yeah, that's right. a, that's a great uh, theme, I would say. Yeah, yeah. So apropos, we leave you today with the words of Philip K. Dick: Our flight must be not only to the stars, but into the nature of our own being because it is not merely where we go, but what we are as we make our pilgrimage there. Our natures will be going there, too.